Why are we building a financial arc? What troubles you today about our economy and our financial prospects? I just concluded that there were five serious issues that were going to lead the United States into an era where it would be as difficult, if not more, than it was during well, during our Great Depression. The gold price has reached new all-time highs, broken world records. What is next? How should investors feel about the current environment and what's to come? Peter Grandich is here to break this down for us. He is a founder of Peter Grandich & Co. He's had decades of experience investing on Wall Street and, in particular, the gold and gold mining sectors. We'll be talking about his views and what he thinks is next for the economy and how you should build a wealth preservation arc. Welcome back to the show, Peter. Always an honor to host you. It's been a while. Thank you for being here. <laughs> it's an equal, if not more, honor to be interviewed by you, young man. You have grown before my eyes, and I really appreciate this honor once again to speak to you. Well, thank you. Our, our program is very lucky to have you back. Uh, Peter, let's start by talking about what has been happening with the gold price. I don't have to remind you that the charts look fantastic for gold. Um, are you concerned, though, that this rally has run above gold's course? In other words, gold's overbought. Has that thought ever occurred to you? Well, I was thinking when we were coming on, when I first started speaking to you at another place, yeah. I felt like when I was talking about 2,500, when it was 1,600, the only people mentioning 2,500 were gold bullion dealers and me. And I'm not a gold bullion dealer. I don't sell coins or anything. And I understand why they always had an optimistic outlook. I think we run a lot, David. I, I know people like to get more excited uh, and think it's going to continue, Uh but I think it's as fair that the next 100 to 200 could be down as much as up. It's certainly not the end of this run, but it's very overextended. I also think more attention is going to be paid to silver now because it has it had underperformed compared to gold. But I think they're still in secular bull markets that still have a long way to go. But it's too much extended now, gold, not that it couldn't be beneficial, it will be, to actually have a, a consolidation and a correction. Okay, we're going to come back to that. But I know in a, a few years ago, when I first started speaking with you, you were saying that you were backing up the truck, loading up on miners and the gold sector overall. I think you had, at that time, you were shifting your asset strategy into gold. Is that still your strategy today, a few years yeah, later? Yeah, well, it, it then went into uranium. And earlier this year, because I haven't had a chance to speak to you at the yeah. beginning of the year, uh, I moved out of uranium, not because I didn't think it was over, but I felt that gold and, and the non-uranium metals were going to do better. And uh, they basically have. I, I still, let's just put it this way. We're more than halfway through whatever this bull market ends up being, but this it's still as good of the second half as the first half was. But it's certainly not anywhere throw a dot, can't miss attitude. I felt gold was at 12 or 1300, staring at 2400. Now I know people are going to say, and I know there's very bullish people out there that are going to say, well, it's in new, uncharted territory. There is no resistance at all. Yes, there is some resistance. And it's, it's the idea of normal profit taking after something has moved a lot. And I think uh, it's just a little too much froth at the moment in gold to think we're going straight to 3000 from here. Uh, speaking to Ron Paul, former presidential candidate and congressman, he told me that it's very likely gold will add another zero in our lifetimes just because of how it's done in the past. It was he, he remembers when it was just, uh, you know, below fifty dollars, then it went to two hundred and then it went to two thousand. And now look where it's at. Right. So he said another zero in our lifetimes is possible. Where do you stand on that? Well, he makes a good point in this. Most people would guess this wrong. But since January 1st, 2000 gold has outperformed both the stock and bond market and most people even in the professional community would get that answer wrong thinking that the stock somehow did better than gold it, it has always been and you know i've called this in the past the rodney dangerfield investment it's never gotten the respect nor do i ever expect mainstream wall street to ever get behind it because they've always treated it like crypto night but it's gotten to the point now where people are recognizing that this accumulation is for something so big, maybe bigger than anything we've ever seen in our lifetime, because to have driven it to this level, given how narrow the interest is in it, it certainly has been accumulated for something more than a trade or a speculation. And obviously, it's going to be something that we've talked about in the past and that there's a big change coming afoot in the world monetarily and otherwise. And I told you back in the early days that the BRIC nations we're going to be behind it, and it makes sense for them to accumulate gold because when they do finally want to compete openly with the United States, 
having something that gold backs is going to give them a much better palatable acceptance of whatever new they come out with than it just being another type of fiat currency. Sorry, can you, can you just elaborate a little bit more on this global change that you're referring to? What's this going to look like? So the BRIC nations, Wall Street, is. this is probably the biggest thing I think Wall Street, when I say general Wall Street, is going to miss and that is what the BRIC nations and the formation of them and what it's going to lead to. I have said since three years ago when I first got behind it, is that when they're all said and done, what they will do to world trade will be comparable to what the Industrial Revolution did to world trade. And to because how big I believe they're going to get, they will eventually come up with something alternative to the dollar, even if it's just among themselves and not a new world reserve currency or whatever. And to have gold in some form backing whatever that is will be much more palatable when they have to compete directly with the dollar than just being another type of fiat currency. And that's one of the main reasons why I believe especially China has been accumulating it and will continue to accumulate it. Okay. Um, this transition is going to happen right away. Is it going to, there's going to be some sort of catalyst that's going to propel this transition? How will it unfold, you think? Well, after 40 years and losing enough money to last nine lifetimes, things normally take a lot longer and become a lot harder than we expect. But I will tell you this, the BRIC situation is gaining momentum. It's not losing momentum. The United States is losing momentum on the world stage, both economically, politically, and otherwise. And I really think once you see a couple more key countries fully join the BRIC, then I believe it'll steamroll. So I have said that in the next three to five years, uh, coinciding with also a very negative view I have in the U.S. about building a financial arc, sure. I think BRICS will coincide with the United States in serious economic, social, and political trouble, and the BRICS becoming a formidable compat a, a competition on the world trade stage. Here's my, we're going to come back to this in the financial arc. Uh, here's my analysis of Golden. Please uh, correct me if you think I'm, uh, not correct here, but if you look at the drivers of gold traditionally, stock market correction, a huge one. Well, that hasn't happened yet. The stock stock markets up until last week have been hitting new all time highs. Cryptocurrency correction, again, same thing. Um, interest rates going down. Well, in, real interest rates have, have actually been going up, not down. Inflation going up. Well, inflation's been holding steady, hasn't been going up. Um, the dollar going down. Well, the dollar actually has been spiking the last six weeks. The only variable that I could think of that would be behind gold's rally is the expectation of war. In other words, heightened geopolitical tensions. That's the only thing that I could think of that is driving investors to rush into gold. Am I off here? Or where, 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 would you agree? Well, there's several in that I would have a different opinion, and none of us is right. It's opinion until it's proven what opinion proved right or wrong. Sure. So neither one of us is right or wrong at this point in time. <laughs> I will tell you this. This is a dramatic difference to move at the level that it has and the offtake of physical is not the normal investing reasons why average people are running into gold. This is primarily uh, a, a very small select group, central bankers and very, very sophisticated people. And they're doing it because they recognize uh, several things, including that people are moving away from U.S. assets in general. U.S. citizens may not yet. That's why they've been able to pick up the slack and buy in treasury bonds that rates have not gone as high as they should be going. But the bottom line is the reason gold has moved up, it's not the normal stuff or real interest rates, this or inflation. It's because there's a dramatic unfolding yet not to be recognized yet by a lot of people. But some of us believe this big change coming on the world stage economically and monetarily. Well, let me ask you because you're a seasoned investor, why would you buy gold today? Let's say, you know, we're speaking on the 17th of April, the middle of April, what would your reason be? Are you expecting war? Are you expecting an economy to fall into recession? Basically, what's your thesis here in the intermediate term? So as you noted, I was backing up the truck when it was 12 and 1600. So actually, most recently in the last few days, I've certainly told the clientele that we have in our planning group that I'm more than willing to take 5 to 25% off the table now because I bought it mostly for capital appreciation. I didn't buy it because I felt that someday I am going to need a piece of gold in order to live. Sure. Now, I believe that argument is a decently strong argument. I don't think the conspiracies and all the what some people would call the crazies, I don't think they're all that crazy. I think things could get very, very ugly. 
I, for one, I think believe it's going to happen in the U.S. But I will never, because of my personal beliefs and faith beliefs, ever feel that I have to live that way. But I don't think gold's as attractive at 2400 as it was 1200 especially when I think the limit to its upside is going to be nothing more, and still will be phenomenal, nothing more than 50% more from where it is now. So a good part of the move is over. Do you still want to own it? If you believe in those fearful things, yes, you should have it as an alternative to paper currencies. Mm -hmm. But as a pure capital play, I don't think it's attractive. In fact, as I've said in recent days, when copper was at four, I moved more interest and felt copper would outperform gold going forward. I even think silver can outperform gold going forward here now. Doesn't mean gold's bad. It's just yeah. not as attractive as it once was. Makes sense. And what about the miners? Are you attracted to the miners at current valuations? We were having such a good interview. Why would you have to bring up something that's so <laughs> negative? I mean, if you want to talk about the biggest blooper in my 40-year career, was thinking two years ago, my God, mining shares, look how cheap they are. They only fallen about 50 to 70% on average since then. And that's what my portfolio in them looks like. I, I, I'm at a loss, David. I Maybe some people always have a reason to tell you why something's doing something. I'm at a loss to explain the discrepancy now, especially since how much acceleration we've seen in the metal prices. I think there's some fair excuses, so I'll throw them at you. But I don't know if they're all totally legitimate. First is the junior resource market in particular. The type of people that used to play it aren't around anymore. Um, most of those people have moved on to other things. In fact, you have know now that your news in Canada about a lot of news is coming out about pension funds and all haven't even been investing in Canada. They've been investing away from Canada. And the mining industry has suffered from that. The second thing is, is that the competition, listen, there are very, you know it because I've always joked at you when I've been very negative on Bitcoin, the younger the people are, the more aggressive, I'll use the word aggressive, their emails are. They're never going to touch gold in the same way I'm never going to touch Bitcoin. So there are some legitimate reasons why mining shares, financing, regulatory, uh, politicalization, people concerned now. I personally wouldn't invest anywhere outside of North America because of the risk I think a mining company will face out there. But outside of all that, especially with gold at 2400 copper at 440 silver, and many of the shares, including some of the biggest majors from New Montebarra, are still down 50% or more. I, I don't have a real legitimate answer other than to say this to you, David. If you believe metals aren't going out of business, which they're not, it's, it's not like there's a new era and we don't need uh, bicycles anymore because cars have been invented. We're going to need metals 5, 10, 20 years from now. Sooner or later, they have to move. There's just no about it. The only difficulty is some of them had to run out of gas now. They can't get capitalized. They've issued too many shares. The stock price is too low. So there's going to be a washing out of the real cheap, uh, overextended juniors. But sooner or later, they need to catch up. Now, what may first happen, which would be really the last shake, is we may get this correction if I'm right in gold, and those shares, what little people have faith in them, will just throw in the towel and say, that's it. They, they even missed the move in gold. But I do think if you're investing for more than the next few weeks or a couple of months, I, I, I'm putting more money into the mining shares as we speak. It's possible. And again, just another theory that now is the time that investors are starting to pay attention to the sector with gold making mainstream headline, right? At $2,400 an ounce. Uh, before other things, like you said, cryptocurrencies, tech stocks were... Uh, drawing the luster of these more speculative investors. So maybe now is when we start seeing a move. Oh, I, I agree with you, David. I, I I see it. People aren't chasing them yet. I will tell you what I've heard in the last week or two, which I think bode well. If you looked at a lot of the news is coming out on private placements, almost all of them were bumped up and bumped up a lot. Yes. So the, so the demand has been very, very good in that. Uh, the interest... People that I haven't heard from in, in, in several years have reached out now and said maybe it's time and all. So, yeah, like I said, that's the only reason why I continue to pour more money back into them. Uh, but they still, if somebody, if you would have said to me when we were interviewing three years ago and said to me, Pete, I'm going to talk to you on April 17th and gold's not 1600 anymore, it's 2400 and copper's no longer 250 it's 450 I would have said to you, mining shares have tripled and quadrupled and they're lower today than they were when they were back then. So I, I, 
I, I'll be one of the few people to tell you, I don't know why they haven't done what they should have done, Dave. It's only okay if it's only just a few. Well, by the way, the GDX and GDXJ have been rising in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but interestingly, if you look at a chart, and I'll put a chart on the screen. The GDXJ, the Junior Mining um, Index, has just started to correct alongside the rest of the stock markets while gold kept going up. So now we're starting to see a divergence. Gold is still holding steady at around twenty four hundred. Mining stocks are falling. So again, I, I'm just positing a theory here. Um, if risk off. Sentiment starts taking over the markets, then we're going to see a broad sell up of everything. Correct? Well, if there's a real sh listen, I've always said this. Uh, there's no way somebody one day is going to look and see the Dow down 20 or 30 percent, their bonds are losing 10, 20 percent, and call up their advisor and say, Pick me up some junior resource stocks. It's, right. just, it's just not going to happen in that, in that regard. But I do think that probably as a sector, the most undervalued sector that I could look at right now. There's nothing else. When you look at it and you add up that somebody that I spoke to earlier today brought up the fact that if you add up the total valuation of gold itself and all the companies that mine it, it doesn't equal even 1% of all investments. That's too small for what's happening in the world and what gold is going to become, as we talked earlier, yeah. as a monetary uh, factor again. So if you're patient enough and you can look past the next few weeks, which is very tough now, can I just say this to you? One mistake I would tell speculators, because that's what we are. We're not investing in juniors. We're speculating. We're gambling. You need to stretch out your horizon. Even the best companies can't have news every day and all. It takes a little bit longer than a week or a month. We, if we're more patient than a week or a month, I find it very difficult not to believe that the mining shares won't be substantially higher if we have an interview six or 12 months from now. Peter, in your many years of experience investing in this sector, what would you say distinguishes a good management team from a mediocre one? In other words, if you were to go up to a meeting and ask a few questions to the management team to gauge whether or not you should invest in that team, which questions would you ask? Well, I, I have to say, and, 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 I, and I've gotten hurt yet again, despite having all this experience as, that you speak of, I think one thing overriding which continue is past success plays a critical uh, factor here. You don't get a special discount when they haven't had been successful in developing a mine or being able to raise capital and so forth. You don't, that, that person doesn't get a special break. They have to deal in the same regard as somebody that's really, really good at what they do. So past history and past experience is a critical factor in, in this game. Uh, and I, I, I also think how they financed it and where, what they own, do they own a lot? And if they own a lot, did they put real dollars in it? It didn't come from a bunch of, you know, stock option grants and things of that nature. I think skin in the game would be, I guess, is the best answer now that I've learned the hard way. It's very important. The more I looked at the ones that had skin in the game, they certainly worked harder than the ones that didn't have skin in the game. By, by skin in the mick game, you mean? Their own money invested. They have okay. large positions. They, you know, they they take down a lot of the private placements and things of that nature. And there are people like out out there like that. Wouldn't that uh, be a risk though if they sell their shares that would move the market? Of course, it's always a risk. But you you're going in on the basis that you're betting on them, and then they're, they're going to be successful and, right. and not be sellers. So, uh, and and the other thing is, this is a line that a lot of guys didn't like me saying when I used to be a speaker when the uh, junior companies were on the other side of all exhibiting, but this is a business where failure is the norm. For every one company that's going to explore, develop, and, and bring in a mine into production, seven or eight aren't going to, no matter how hard they try. And so if you just buy and hold for years after years, it's very hard, very hard to come out a winner in this. So you have to also be selective. And something that I've also will say is there seems to be a lot harder times in this business than there are times when things are going very, very well. They go very, very well for a rather short period of time, but it's not long lasting. So what is your favorite commodity right now as a as an investment? I, my, my favorite commodity right now is copper. Mm -hmm. um, copper has replaced gold as my number one and believe it or not, gold and silver would be nip and tuck, and maybe even silver is a little bit ahead of it, only because it has a lot more room before I would believe it would become overly expensive. It has a, it has an ever-improving fundamental argument that didn't exist 10 or 20 years ago, 
And even though it loses out somewhat on the monetary side, it more than makes up for it on the industrial side. What, what, what is his argument? Can you recap it for us? Well, people have sometimes not bought silver because it's, it's really not used or hoped to be used in any monetary way, uh, and, and which is true. But at the same time, its industrial use has increased dramatically while new supply has not. That's probably the biggest frustration in all of this, David, is, is that never has the fundamentals of supply and demand look so positive for so many metals. Better than I've ever seen it at any other time, and yet the shares aren't anything close to what they used to be when something like this came close to happening. If you're bullish in copper, are you also bullish in the global growth aspect of the economy? Well, I think that Dr. Cop copper argument is going to be put on the shelf, uh, okay. first of all. And the reason is we we because that was the days when there were lots of supply and known supply. So when the economy slowed, oh my God, there's enough copper out there. We don't have to worry about it. You know, bring the price down. That's not the case anymore. One of the big surprises here in 2024 for the for the bears in 2023 was they were expecting an an oversupply of copper in 2024, and it's clear and evident now that we have a deficit of it. Of it, and uh, quite frankly. They don't say it out loud, but I don't know. I don't think any major mining copper company or copper gold company is going to want to start sinking billions of dollars, especially in places outside of North America, uh, without copper being at least above five, because the grades have dropped so dramatically now. And so these large tonnage uh, operations, which cost so much more money to build and run and risk, especially with all the social and political stuff that's happening in the world, we're going to need a copper price above five dollars to really see serious money go back into looking for new deposits worldwide. Uh, by the way, just side stepping a bit, the EV uh, narrative by right, electric cars. I've been reading reports, uh, consumer reports, that uh, people are the consumers are less interested in electric vehicles now than they were several years ago. Tesla certainly is responding to this. Um, as you know, Elon Musk just announced he's laying off 10% of the Tesla global workforce. Uh, companies like Mercedes, who have previously promised to be completely EV by 2030, now backtracked on that promise. They're no longer doing it. I wonder if this narrative will continue, this EV narrative. Uh, there's no question about that. And I think we were over-optimistic two years ago about how everybody and his mother was going to have something to do with electrical vehicles and stuff. But it certainly has been a change in tilted, and we're finding usage and, and, and NEC sources still needed alternative to just cars, but other types of uh, needs because we're we're falling short on uh, on providing proper electrical needs. So I don't think the declining view of the EV market compared to the froth that existed a couple of years ago is going to dramatically change the outlook for copper prices. Fair enough. Uh, let's talk about this financial arc you mentioned earlier. Let's come back to that. My question is why? Why are we building a financial arc? What troubles you today about our economy and our financial prospects? So I, what's left of my livelihood in my 40th year is part of a, of a planning group here in the U.S. And uh, I'm their big picture guy within the group. And at the beginning of the year, I just concluded that there were five serious issues that we're going to lead the United States into an era where it would be as difficult, if not more, than it was during well, during our Great Depression. And those five issues, and I'll just name if you want to discuss them, that's fine. If yes. that's first and foremost is the debt issue. Uh, we're, we're getting to the point now where paying the interest is going to be a challenge. We're finally seeing, by the way, if I may add, Dave, and I'm glad to see it, we're finally seeing titans of business and within the financial communities worldwide bringing that up. Even the IMF spoke about it today. That's a very serious issue. The ability to even pay our interest, let alone forget about ever paying back the principal. The second issue is, I've talked to you about it before, and that's an increasing retirement and aging crisis. 65% of Americans are working paycheck to paycheck. Uh, they are all going to need to work older uh, into life. They're going to need more support as they get older. So that will be an economic strain and a struggle. The, the number three has moved to what challenge number one in recent days and weeks. And I said back in January 1st, we were under here in the US an immigration invasion. And 
I called it an economic invasion, not that people are coming with guns or knives or the vast majority of people are coming are just looking for a better life, but they're coming with just the clothes on their back. And so the economic cost to that, which we're seeing now just in a few months, uh, paralyzed major cities, New York, we just seen it and others, that was going to continue to be uh, another economic, social, and political problem. The fourth is the BRICS. You and I just discussed it, so I don't have to go over that. And then the fifth is the one that you would hope could fix the four, but it's the most broken of them all. And that's here in the U.S. We have political paralysis, Dave. The Democrats and the Republicans, the two major parties, cannot work together in any rhyme or reason to perform and do any of the things necessary to be done. And the compounding of that now is each party has a fraction uh, in their group, which is splintering away. In the Democrats, they're moving to more to the left. And in the Republicans, they're moving more to the right. So someday when all this hits the fan, which seems to be sooner than later, the political will to do the hard stuff that would be needed to try to correct this or at least slow down or stop it from getting worse isn't there. And therefore, to our clients, you need to have a financial arc. And the theme of the arc is this, besides less is more and live within your means, is that Governments are only going to have two choices, whether on the federal level, state or local, raise taxes and cut services. So you're going to be more needed to fend for yourself. And in order to do that, you need to make sure you had the proper savings and live within a means to when those hardships come, you don't get penalized as other people will because they're overextended. And the simplest sentence that I use is, Capital preservation now is more important than capital appreciation. Doesn't mean you give up on capital appreciation, but you need to make sure first that your capital preservation is taken care of. And then if there's excess, we can look at capital appreciation. Okay. I want to come back to capital preservation, but since you brought up demographics, there's two trends that are working together over the long term. So over the coming decades, it's projected that the fertility rate, which is the number of babies per, per female, will decline or continue to decline. It's currently at just over 2 point something, 2.1 or 2.2 um, births per female. It was at five several decades ago. That's going to continue declining. So the birth rate is going to go down. At the same time, the average life expectancy in most developed countries will go up to the point where people are talking about raising the retirement age. So we've got an older population and fewer births. What does that mean for Social Security? Well, it just adds to the issue. It, by the way, that falls into in the deeper talk that I have in my retirement and aging issue. That's part of it. You bring up a, an excellent, excellent point. And all those people, like any good human being, is going to look for their government to help support them to get through the tougher challenges and what have you at a time when our government is spending twice as much as it's taken in each month. And it's just it's infantable that some people think that that can go on endlessly, especially past the next few years. I don't think it's more than when you asked me before about dates. I use three to five years when we talk to our clients and prospective clients, but it wouldn't shock me that this could occur within 12 or 24 months. Now, some people say this, well, won't the election play a role in that? And if such and such wins or whatever the case may be, I'll just say this. We are so divided here that even if the person who's currently running to be president again wins. And some people think, well, somehow that's going to fix everything overnight. My comment to them always is if the people were so against him to get in, if he gets in, do you think they're just going to walk away from that or they're going to even make things tougher and harder? So I don't see any uh, civility uh, returning to America's landscape. I, in fact, I will not be surprised. And, and again, I'm not here to tell people to run out and buy gold or anything. But I think part of the other issues that we talk about, I think is coming is we're going to see more silver unrest. The, there's now seven to 10 million people here that are, as we saw just in New York yesterday, expecting the government to do something for them. And then there's people that are already here that are legitimate citizens. What little they were getting is now being taken away from them. They're not going to stand for that. And eventually those two sides are going to meet each other in the middle. And I'm afraid it's not going to be pretty. Uh, speaking of civil unrest, this I, I, this is foreign to me from somebody living in Canada. I want to get your take as you're in the U.S. In San Francisco, they've recently proposed a bill that would allow people to sue grocery stores 
for shutting down without six months notice. Uh, as you know, crime rate has been going up in California. A lot of stores are closing because of theft or crime or whatnot. This is, I'm just going to read a paragraph from this article. The San Francisco Board of Supervisors is considering a remarkable policy that would allow people to sue grocery stores that close too quickly. Earlier this week, supervisors Dean Preston and Aaron Peskin introduced an ordinance that, if passed, would require grocery stores to provide six months written notice to the city before closing down. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, would you want to do business in a place that makes a restriction like that? Uh, my advice has been constant for almost a decade to the, anybody that lives in the People's Republic of California. Get out while you can. I mean, the restrictiveness of that and the punishing business owners because they can't survive because of crime and other reasons is I like to say it's laughable, but it's not because it, I don't expect it to be limited just to San Francisco. I expect left other leaning cities as people start to leave in droves, which they are, try to institute some things to somehow show that they're trying to stop uh, hardworking business people. Remember this, a lot of those companies they're talking about are small little grocery store things and not the big super yeah. chains. And the small business owner has been the backbone of the United States. And they and they haven't seen good legislation for business owners in 20 years. So uh, it, 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 it's one of the more preposterous things, but not, nothing surprises me that comes out of California, David. To well, be truthful. My next question isn't just for California, but generally speaking, what should be done by um, the administration to support small businesses? Well... I don't know if it's just administrations, uh, but this one in particular that is currently administration, I haven't seen it do anything that I think is positive for small businesses. Uh, it may have worked for very large conglomerates. The, the backbone of this is that is the government has to start to live with it in its means uh, before anything really can get done seriously over the long period of time. David, they, in the last three years, we raised our debt levels here that previously took 37 years to get to that level. So the acceleration of the debt and the spending is growing far more proportionally than anything else. And it's unsustainable. It's just unsustainable. And that's, again, why I think, you know, Dave, I like to say this. I'm sure when Noah on the sunny days was starting to build the ark, they looked, hey, what are you building an ark for? It's sunny and 80 degrees. I get the same thing now, like, well, what do you have? To, but I really think you have to do it because by the time it's raining and pouring, it's going to be too late. So what are you putting in this ark, Peter? I mean, which animals are you picking, so to speak? Well, the, the single biggest animal is living within your own means. Okay. As we still find seven out of eight out of ten families in the U.S., David, live beyond their means, which means they're continuing to, to either borrow or take away from things that should be put away for later to live a lifestyle now. That has to stop. Debt, to me, has always been a terrible 34-letter word. The less you have of it or not have of it, the better off you will be. Uh, but I also think you have to understand that you're not going to be able to depend on others. There's going to be a more dependency on yourself. So saving wherever you can and living within a budget. Uh, most people don't have a budget. And even the people that go and get so-called a financial plan done, they get it done on a, a plan A, the best case scenario. But if the best case scenario doesn't work out, they don't have a plan B. And I think you have to have plans A, B, and maybe even C going forward. We talked about gold as a wealth preservation tool. Um, I've heard this from some people. Bet on the American economy. Bet on American capitalism. Just put in your money in a S&P 500 index fund. Go away for 20 years. Collect your riches. Do you agree or disagree? I, I, think, that, I think that worked for a lot of years because we were borrowing against – ourselves when we can still live within that. Listen, Nobel laureates have shown studies that 80% of uh, equity fund managers and 85% of bond fund managers underperform an index fund. So in that case, in that case, owning a simple index fund versus having somebody to manage your money, eight out of 10 times has proved uh, more valuable. I think those times that you speak of and to use those percentages were times of different conditions that are no longer prevalent and no longer uh, doable. And that's the other reason why I believe, you know, wanting that building off now is critical in my mind. Okay. Well, Peter, I appreciate you giving us your update. 
that was a very good interview. You ran through a lot of topics. Where can we learn about uh, your work, follow you? Well, all three people that by now would want to still hear from me can reach me at uh, petergranich.com. Uh, but I do most of my work, David, on Twitter. I feel it's the most effective and fastest way for me to communicate. Yeah. And I also have a YouTube channel as well. What, what, uh, let me close off on this. What advice do you have for the younger people who, like me, are concerned about our future, who are uncertain about the economy, uncertain about our job prospects? Um, as you know, many younger people uh, today can't afford homes, especially when you're living in an expensive city like Vancouver. So we're all just thinking about what to do here. I think it's, you know, I have a daughter, 31, David, and yeah. I think in modern history, so over several hundred years, no age group had more of a challenge now than people, say, between 20 to 40. I think that what, what they have to go up against uh, is not anywhere as much as some of the cards and environment and all that I was able to grow up in. And I just think that error on the side of caution, be a live chicken versus a dead duck, and uh, recognize that uh, there are still great things in the world to enjoy. Uh, and you don't need everything that the social world tells you social media is going to lead to happiness. Happiness many times comes and it lasts a lot longer in some of the more simpler things in life. And many of those things are free given to us by whoever created this great earth. Well, the saying that hap money doesn't buy happiness. Do you actually agree with that? Well, I'm firsthand experience of it. I made and lost it not once, but twice. And only when I come to where it wasn't the main thing I was getting up for each morning to achieve, did I ever reach a happiness mass that was sustainable. And the more people I share that with, and the more I have people share me the same thing. Uh, I've heard people say it another way, money doesn't buy happiness, but you can rent it. Yeah, you can rent it, but you have to return all rentals eventually. And so, uh, uh, it, it shouldn't be the single most important priority in your life. Certainly, you need some of it to get by, but I think there's other more important things. Listen, uh, you could cut this off and not be part of the interview, but you're a prime example. Look at the growth that you've just had in these last few years in your career. And you've done it by saying what you've told me is you work so much that you don't have time to go out. Hard work does pay off. That's what I would tell people. Don't, you can't, there was a game of life where you could not go to school and start out fast, but always the people that went to school towards the end of the game came on and beat you most of the times. I, I think I, hard work and, and dedication and not expecting everything to be handed to you is an important thing now going forward. I, I, well, I appreciate the uh, compliment. I really do. But I, I think where the young people are getting frustrated is that they believe that the American dream is dead, that hard work isn't going to pay off. I can work my butt off. And I'm still not going to become successful, however they define success. Well, I think the problem there is, David, I think it's because they're defining success in a different way than perhaps I had defined success. And that success is something more immediate and more higher up. They're, they want to go from the ground floor on an express elevator to the penthouse without having to work their way up. And it's really life is stairs. It's not an elevator. You got to take the stairs. Sometimes you stumble. And hopefully over time, you can get to the top of the staircase. I just, one final point. I saw a clip of Warren Buffett answering this question. Somebody asked him, what is success? And he said, you know, coming from the richest investor in the world, he said that if you're 70 years old and you, the people that you want to love still love you, then that's success. How would you, how would you respond to that? Well, my comment, since you brought that up, which I say to people is, we're all going to have a dash. And people say, what do you mean the dash? Well, we're going to have a grave site. There's going to be a date of the birth, and there's going to be a date when we exited this earth. Sure. When people look at that dash, what do you want them to say? What do you want them to say when they look at your dash? And that's what you have to live with. And, uh, mm. you know, I have my beliefs, and I believe you have yours. And, and that's what you need to ask yourself these days. Eventually, someday you won't be here. I know it's hard to imagine when you're younger, but what do you want? What do you want it to be said about yourself? And I think that's that's more important than maybe making a few more dollars. Hmm. Beautiful message. Thank you again, Peter. We'll speak again soon. Thank you, David. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.